Now, the topic of my sermon this morning, I'm going to be talking about how to study the Bible, but in specific, I'm going to be talking about extra biblical resources, right? So we know that if you want to know more about God in the Bible, you're going, to, you know, you're going to read the Bible, right? This is our primary source for our information about truth, for what's right, for you know, learning about Jesus, learning about God, and everything else is going to come from this book. This is definitely the primary resource. This is the Word of God. These are God's words. These are not man's words. And that's what we believe here. But a lot of people like to um, use other things to supplement their learning and everything else. Now, I'm going to start off just by saying that your primary source of information ought to be from this book. I'm not completely 100% against every other means of learning other than the Bible. But what we have to understand and know to be true is that these words are true. They're infallible. They are perfect. They are without error. As soon as we go outside of this book, you cannot say that about any, any source of information that you receive. This we know to be true. Everything else you may or may not know to be true. So as long, I mean, you, you definitely have to have that understanding right off the bat. That anything, you know, when we read the news today, when, you know, um, anything that you read, anything you absorb, I mean, it could be a history book, it could be anything about current events, about history events, it doesn't matter. You cannot know 100% that what was written is actually the truth. I mean, the Bible says, let God be true, but all men are liars. You know, like, uh, all men can lie. None of us are perfect, right? Everyone has an agenda. And also, everyone perceives things a little bit differently also. The way that, that your worldview is, it shapes how you perceive things. And that includes us. That includes every human being. W the way that you view the world, the way, the way your, your, your core belief system is going to influence the information that you take in. For example, we're Christians. We, we believe in the Bible. We believe it so... When we see events going on, you might see things saying, oh yeah, of course, that lines up perfectly with the Bible. And, you, and you, could, you could relate things that you see. You could see persecutions. You could see tribulations. You can see you know, wicked people. And you could say, wow, that, you know, everything lines up here. And this is lining up perfectly with the way that we perceive the world. Other people look at things in a different, in a different light. And they can see the same event happen and come across with a completely different conclusion. Right now, an easy way to, to to demonstrate this, even just regardless of the worldview, is just the way that people can perceive things slightly different. Is let's say there's a there's an accident, there's a car wreck, and there's like ten people standing around and witnessing this event. Every one of those people will give probably a slightly different account of what actually happened with that you know they the way that they saw things the things that they thought that they saw you know going back and recollecting and, and using their memory to play back in their mind what actually happened who did what and and even if all of them are consciously trying to tell the truth right just just start off just saying hey everyone they're all just just doing their best effort to, to explain what they perceived, what they saw happen, you'll still get different conflicting statements oftentimes. They're not always going to be perfect, right? And that's why sometimes it's hard uh, as, as information starts becoming available on big events, it changes a lot um, because you're getting information from different sources and they could be very different from each other. So... Um, even just something as simple as that, and you could say maybe potentially as meaningless as, as you know, in the overall scheme of things, as one minor accident or something, uh, people who intend well can be saying different things and sometimes not even telling the truth and not even knowing it, right? Now, in addition to the, to the innocent differences and maybe inaccuracies of what people uh, recall and reflect or, or write down or, or will state to be as true, you have intentional lyings and you have you people intentionally being uh, deceptive and, and saying things in a way that, uh, that fits their agenda, right? 
Now think about where you get your news from. There's all types of different sources to get your information from what's going on in the world around us. Um, at least if you care about that or if you follow it at all. I think that we ought to care about what's going on in the world. I don't think we should be overly consumed with it. Some people could go overboard. It's easy to, to get too wrapped up in the things of this world and everything that's going on and, and start freaking out about it or whatever. And we need to make sure we have a good balance. But it, it is also important to just know what's going on in the world. We don't want to be ignorant. We want to be able to, to at least... Um, Know what's going on to the point to be able to prepare for ourselves and, and um, be ready for anything that might be coming in, uh, in knowing what's going on. But there's so many different sources. You know, people used to get their information solely from like newspapers and writing. That was like the, the main means of, of transmitting information, right? And then the TV came along, and then that became really popular. Now the TV is fading as far as where people get their information from, and a lot of people get their information from the Internet and from multiple sources. But regardless of where you get your information from, think about each one in particular and how different are the various sources from each other. Now, you think about, on, on, at least on a TV, right, you have... You have the liberal media, which anyone who has a liberal point of view is going to gravitate towards basically everything but Fox. And then on Fox, you have like the neocon point of view being presented. And that's why you can have two people, two news organizations report on the same incident and have like totally different reports talking about what happened and the reasons behind it and everything else. And the impression that you're left with after reading that news is going to be very different and where you think the source of the problem is, is going to be very different depending on where you get your information from. And you could be talking about the same exact thing, the same exact problems, and you find very different um, points of view or perspective on it. Now, I'm bringing all of this up to kind of reference, you know, we know right now, and I've seen it, I've read it, I've looked at the news, I have been a, a witness to specific events that were reported on by the media and by the news, and I have seen this personally, the skew, the bias, the only including certain things to, to intentionally push their, whatever they want to push, their agenda, their, their, uh, their, point they're trying to make with leaving out very critical information including half truths half half statements to push their agenda and to try to make something look really extreme or whatever and not giving the full story and being very dishonest about it i've seen that firsthand i know that we cannot trust definitely that the mainstream media the major news outlets because they do this now, there's some people that are honest, the independent media, will, that will try to, to the best of their ability, present the information without skewing it too much. But we all have somewhat of a bias no matter what. But we need to understand that there has always been people who are going to pick and choose one little statement here, one little statement there, to, to paint a picture and to show you this is what's happening or this is what's going on, this is what these people are about, without giving you a full view. And um, this has been happening all throughout time. So when you think about history, right? History is written by the victor, by the people who win the war. You know, like, let's say there's a war, right, between two countries, and one country just totally dominates the other one and they win. Whose version of the events that happened do you think that you're going to end up reading about later on in the future? It's not going to be the people that lost because their, their information is going to be muffled out. It's going to be silenced, right? Because the people that won are just going to be like, this is what happened. We had the righteous cause and, and, and give you all the events that happened from their perspective and the, what, the, the history that they want you to know about, which may not be what actually happened. So when we read history books, when we go back, you know, how sure, how can you know that you can trust the accuracy of historical events that happened long ago. How do you know the way that the battles went? How do you know what even the reasons were for those attacks or for those battles, for those wars? 
I mean, we know as recently as today, the, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are not the, the real reason for those wars are not the reason that we were fed by the media. It's not because there was these Afghani, you know, terrorists, the Taliban in these caves that hijacked planes and, and you know, flew them into the towers and we we're so worried about them being able to make an attack on our country that we had to go and just, you know, make war against a country that had nothing to do with that. We could see the evidence. There's enough evidence coming out that points to that has nothing to do with the official version that was given to us. But you know what? We know that now, and people are trying to write that, but in 100 years from now, or 200 years from now, or 300 years from now, what's going to be the story? And a lot of people have already been deceived by that story that's come out. A lot of people still to this day believe that official story that was given to us. And it's completely false. It's not true at all. But that will be the official record that goes down in history of the events that happen, and it's a lie. And to think that that is the first time that something like that has happened or whatever, no. What's more likely is that there's a lot more people who know the truth now than would have in the past. I think there's a lot more evidence to show that the exposure of these false flag events and of these, of these um, untruths coming out is probably more likely to be known today than it has been in the past. Now, how do we apply this type of a knowledge to the Bible? Like, what are we talking about with the Bible? Well, you can say, yeah, but you could use that same argument for the Bible. How do you know that these things that were written are true? The, the reason why we know is because the Bible is the Word of God. It's very plain and simple. We accept this by faith that this is God's Word. And that's the only way you can accept it. It can't be proven to you. We can't go back and, you know, there, there is plenty of evidence that can show, you know, other uh, accounts in, in archaeology and history that will coincide with what the Bible says and, and, and show that it is true. We do know this. But um, even if we didn't have those things, we know that we have the Word of God. We know that this is true. And um, if you don't like my, my reasoning for that, then that's fine. You don't have to believe it, but you do have to believe the Bible in order to be saved. You have to put your faith in the Word in order to be saved. So um, that choice is up to you. But how do we apply this knowledge to how we should learn about the Bible or the things of the Bible today? Well, because we know that any other source of information could be tainted, could be inaccurate, may not be true, we have to completely rely on this book to, for, as our main source for our doctrine and for everything that we believe. And that anything else that you come across or that you read it's not going to be in contradiction to this. It cannot be. And, and we should not be f forming doctrines off of other sources as our primary source. And really, we ought to be very, very careful as it is when we, when we look at stuff. But we'll get into that a little bit later. I started off here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 11. The Bible reads, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. So the first point I want to make here is that if we want to know anything about God, if we want to know anything about what's righteous and true from the Bible... We're only going to get that through somebody who's saved. A spiritual understanding, you have to have the Spirit of God in order to understand spiritual things. You have to be saved first and foremost. But if you're going to be getting your information from anybody, it ought to be from a Spirit-filled person. Otherwise, it's just coming from the world. And the world can't understand this. That's why the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The unregenerate man, the person who is not saved, that's the natural man. 
They don't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They don't understand them. That's why I understand, you know, unsaved people are, are constantly saying that the Bible's wrong here and there, and they, don't, they can't comprehend the concepts. They don't understand the Word of God. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. They're foolishness unto the world. But on the same token, we shouldn't be going to man's wisdom, to the history of things, in order to understand spiritual things. We need to be going to the source of someone who is who has the Spirit of God. And we know that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost to give us these words. Now this theme is going to be, and that's why we start off in 1 Corinthians 2, is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, apply to every single form of, of media or education or learning, any, every source that we receive. So the first source of extra biblical resources I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about this morning is movies. You know, movies are very popular these days. And we actually have, you know, documentary films back here that we use to support the things that we believe, that we, that we use to spread a message of truth. Right? So I'm not saying that all video formats are wrong. We, we make DVDs. We put up preaching. We put this stuff out and available you know, online and video format for people to learn from, but we need to be careful with what we are putting in front of us. Now, first and foremost, everything that the world puts out is biblically inaccurate. Why? Because of what we just read, because they cannot understand the Bible. It's foolishness under them. They don't understand. So you think about the movies that come out, because people ask about this, oh, well, what about, what about that movie Noah, right? I mean, I know we shouldn't, you know, there's a, Hollywood puts out a lot of wickedness and stuff, but this is about the Bible. I mean, this is, this, is, this is a good movie for Christians to go watch, right? No. No, it's wickedness. The, the world puts out Noah. Who was that? Uh, was that Russell Crowe that was the, the, does anyone know if he was the, the lead actor in that movie? I think so. Um, the guy's wicked. I mean, he, 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 he uh, acts in all kinds of just worldly wicked movies just based out of Hollywood. Hollywood's the one that produced that movie. And we can't expect that anything biblically accurate is going to come out because they, they hate the Bible. They disdain the Bible. And I didn't see the movie. I've, just, I've read about it and I've heard about it. And it's grossly misrepresentative. It's like they had this type of a save the world type of a, or, or like save the planet, like, a, like a, a green peace tree hugger type of a theme to the, to the movie, which that's not what the flood was about at all. And, uh, and many, many things were inaccurate. Uh, the movie Left Behind with Nicolas Cage, right, the new version of it, Hollywood put out. And even the old version is inaccurate, but I mean, this is, the, this is just how you know when Hollywood's producing a movie and Nicolas Cage is starring in it, it's not going to be a, a, a great Christian film. Okay, this is not going to be a source that you want to turn to for, for knowledge and to help you understand something more about the Bible. There was a, even a TV series about the Bible that was put out on TV, I think on the History Channel or something like that. Um, and even going back to like the Ten Commandments, right, the, the old school, like in the 70s, when, when those movies came out, look, none of these movies are biblically accurate. None of them are. They may have bits and pieces that are right, but overall, this is not something that you want to get your source of information from. And here's the th other thing to be careful about is that when you receive this information, when you sit through the movie, it's going to have an impact on how you think about things. Even subliminally or subconsciously, as you read, you know, you, it, it, it may kind of cleave to you and... and pervert your view of, of a doctrine and, and, and kind of change the way you think about it, especially if there's something that you weren't really founded on. You're watching some of this stuff, you're like, oh, that's nonsense, oh, that's ridiculous. And then there's something else that, that is displayed to you that's getting across a message that you weren't really grounded in, now that'll have an influence on the way that you think. So I think we should have, you should avoid all the worldly stuff completely, 100%. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The stuff that Hollywood puts out is of the world. That means the source is from the world. 
When, when you have the, the people who make these films, they're, they're unsaved people, that's of the world. We shouldn't love those things. We shouldn't support those things. We shouldn't go out and get our information by these things. Now, one of the most recent pieces, you could call it, that's being put out recently is by National Pornographic. I mean, Geographic. And it's called The Story of God. And it has Morgan Freeman as like the, the main narrator or whatever. Now, the guy's got a cool voice, but that's about all I could say about him. Like listening to his voice. But that's probably one of the reasons why they have him doing this because people can, you know, it's a soft, nice, easy voice that's easy to listen to and to just bring home whatever devilish doctrines that he, they want to drive home with this series. Now, I saw, I first started seeing like little previews for this thing and what they were doing is they were going around and asking people you know what they you know who is God to you and every single answer and this thing was like five minutes long I watched this little it's a little short video that was, was supposed to be promoting the series and not one person got the answer right so what does that say about how the series is going to go about being able to present the truth about the Bible and who God is and stuff? it's supposed to be this great exploratory thing and I don't know a whole lot about it but I just saw this recently that he's doing this and um, you know explore her mission on, on different religions and what they all believe and I'll tell you what it's gonna be it's gonna be a global acceptance of all religions and they're all pretty good and they're all saying look look at how these say similar things and how we just need to be all inclusive there was an entire episode they did on what happens when we die now what are the odds that they actually promote the truth in that video of what happens when we die I'm going to say very little to none because it's being put out by a bunch of heathens. Now, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 10, you could turn there if you'd like, Jeremiah chapter 10, because what this, what this series is doing is presenting the heathen religions of the world. Right? It's going through. Now, Christianity may be included in that. It probably is. I, I'm sure it would have to be in order to be inclusive when, if that's really the goal of their message. I don't know. I haven't seen them all. You know what? I'm not going to see them. I'm not going to just spend my time and watch them. I started watching the very first one just a little bit to see what it was about because I have it up on the internet. But I'm not just going gonna, gonna to watch all these series and stuff. I just wanted to see where they were going with this. And right off the bat, within the first, I don't know, five minutes or something, I was able to see, oh yeah, they're, they're kind of, it looks like they're, they're pushing this, all religions are equal or, or okay, or that you should respect everyone that believes in all these different things, and that you know, your belief isn't any better than theirs and everything else, that it's all just, you know, the coexist attitude. Like that bumper sticker, right? That, that, that this is, I, I could get that right off the bat, that that's what they're teaching, that, that none of these are really wrong or bad or evil or wicked or heathen. But um, that, that was the impression I got. And again, I didn't see very much of it. I'm not going to see very much. I'm not going to go and watch the whole series or anything like that. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 10, verse 1, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are in vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. And it goes on and on about them building idols and false gods and worshiping them. And God says, look, thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. We don't need to learn their ways. Oh, how do they worship their gods? God says, don't even learn about, don't, don't worry about how they do it. They've got a false God. Because what happened throughout history when they did learn the way of the heathen? Well, they tried to incorporate that then into their service to God. And they would build up these altars and they would defile the, the, the sanctuary and the, and the holy place of God by introducing perversions and these, these other um, forms of worship or whatever into their, into their service. And God's saying, you know what? You know that they're wrong. You know that it's heathen. You know it's an idol. You know it's a false god. You don't have to learn about it. We don't need to learn about all the Egyptian gods. We shouldn't be learning about the Roman and the Greek gods and learning about all the, all the false gods that are out there. And, you know, some people will say, well, how are you going to get, you know, a Mormon saved or Jehovah's Witness saved or something? Don't you have to learn all about the religion? No, you don't. 
Because guess what? The gospel is the same for them as it is for everybody else. Now, you may know what areas that they really need to hear. And that usually just comes by experience through talking with them. But I've never read the whole Book of Mormon. I don't need to. I don't need to study the Book of Mormon and to tell Mormons why their religion is false. Because I have the truth. See, I'm going to spend my time studying this book to be able to point out the error that they believe in when I'm talking with them. I don't care what their stupid Book of Mormon says. I don't care what these, what these other things say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study the truth and what's right in order to be able to expose what's wrong. And, and the more you know this, the easier it's going to be to be able to just show them the truth and, and um, witness to them without even ever having to learn their religion. We don't need to learn the way of the heathen. Now in Colossians chapter 2, you turn to Colossians chapter 2, See, this, this series that I was mentioning, I believe it's pushing for acceptance of all religions, all beliefs, everything's just fine. Yeah, you believe that way. And it's probably going to be like real new agey. And, and this is just my guess. I haven't seen those here. Like I said, I'm not going to. Where, but the impression I got after the first, the first short portion that I started to watch just to get an idea of what it was about was this idea of Oh, see, these people believe in sacrifices, and these people believe in sacrifices, and, you know, in order for eternal life or whatever, they, and they'll go to, like, these wicked, heathen people that, pra like, that did the, like, Baal worshipers, right? They did human sacrifices. And then they'll kind of merge that in with the human sacrifice of Christianity of Jesus Christ, and kind of see how these are, you know, all kind of all believe in just a little bit different, but... But, you know, they all have elements of the same thing. And, and it's a new age belief that just tries to get you all encompassing of saying, oh, yeah, okay, I could see that now. When really it's just a total perversion. I mean, anyone that would sacrifice children or sacrifice any human being, you know, like just, just saying, well, we got to do this to keep the gods happy. Oh, we got to keep on, you know, killing people. Whereas Jesus Christ offered himself up, I mean, we know the whole story of, of Christ and the sacrifice that he made and being the, the lamb slain from the beginning of the world. And the requirement of his blood to be shed to atone for our sins. But all the false religions and the heathen ways, they are going to be based off of the right way, and they're all, but they're all going to be perverted. And we don't need to learn their perversions. And the things that they twist and, and change from the truth into a lie. Because that's all they've done. And, you know, the, the devil is seen as a minister of light, as an angel of light. And people are going to look at satanic religions as being good, as being light, as being true, as being right. Because what he's done is he's, he's mimicked and copied the true religion and what's right, and twisted it and perverted it to sell it to people to, to damn them to hell. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Look at verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you, through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. This is a warning. It is a warning that we need to heed today. Hey, beware lest any man spoil you. Your beliefs, your faith, you could be spoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. So people deceiving you with vanity and, and, and using philosophy to just to change your belief and to pervert what you believe. We need to be aware of that. That we don't allow the, the heathen philosophies to impact us as Christians today. I mean, the, it says after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. And remember we saw already things that are of the world are not of the Father. And the things that are of, of the Father are not of the world. It says and not after Christ. So what I've seen today that's probably influenced people the most is the philosophies behind like political things like libertarianism or anarchism or whatever has crept into Christianity. 
And people will take those philosophies, the, the worldly philosophies that, that men came up with, as being, this is the great truth, the, the, you know, the, that we need to um, follow these great truths that, that we've come up with, and these axioms, and they, these are supreme. And it's influenced the Christians into, into changing their source of truth. And they've been corrupted through philosophy. Now, a lot of it sounds great. And I'm for, in general, libertarian principles and, and, and many of the um, anarchist principles. But I'm not an anarchist. I'm not, you know, I, I identify as I believe this book to be true. And this is the true source of information. But I see people who will, will run with these other philosophies and hold to those tighter than you hold to this. One of the examples is the, you know, the non-aggression principle that, that, you know, it's a, a political theory of, you know, of not, not necessarily political, but the theory of just, you, you know, in general, it's a, it's a decent rule. In general, yeah, we shouldn't be aggressing against other people. Yeah, of course, that's fine. That's great. But they'll take this principle and apply it to other things then, and they'll say, um, with the, uh, for example, uh, you know, because... Let me, let me backtrack a little bit because I completely lost my train of thought on where I was going with that. But the, um, you know, some of the, the, the areas where people get screwed up on the philosophy is, well, what do you determine what's a crime and what's right and what's wrong? So with the non-aggression principle, there's any act against other people. And they'll take that and say, oh, well, as you see, sodomy, that's not an aggressive act against somebody else. That's two consenting adults doing whatever they want to do behind closed doors. And they're saying, well, that shouldn't be punishable by law because of the non-aggression principle. And the Bible says something different. The Bible says that sodomites are to be put to death, that that's God's just judgment. Now, are you going to rely more on the philosophy of men that says that this is true, or are you going to rely on what God says to be true? And we ought not to allow this, this philosophy of the world to corrupt and to pervert what's true and what's good and what's right. We need to beware of the philosophy and the vain deceit through the tradition of men and make sure that we're clinging solely to Christ and to the Bible here as our, as our source of truth. Now, another media, you know, we talk about the movies, you know, people watching movies and being able to get their information that way or TV series or whatever. Music, now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but music is another way in, um, you know, we already saw in 1 John 2.15, you know, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We should not be listening to worldly music, the, the music that the world puts out. It turn, if you would, to Colossians 3. Colossians 3.16, we're going to look at. We are, you're in Colossians 2, right? Colossians 3. Because the, the, the music that the world puts out, it's worldly music. It's stuff that comes from the world. People who are unsaved, just, you know, the rock and roll, the hip-hop, the army, whatever. All these different genres of just unsaved people just promoting their, their music, their art, or whatever you want to call it, right? The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That music is coming from the world. The source is the world. The source is not God. So we shouldn't be loving those things. We shouldn't be listening to those things and being influenced by them. Look at verse 16 of Colossians 3. The Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs are, are a tool that are used for teaching. And I've mentioned this, I think, last week when we were singing the hymns. And I said, you know, praise God for these great hymns that we sing because there's a lot of good doctrine and teaching in these songs. And as we sing them week after week, we are actually learning and confirming and cementing our beliefs through song. Song is a way of teaching. Now, if God is using song as a way of teaching and hymns, spiritual songs, all these different things... Don't you think the world's doing the same exact thing? There's a philosophy of the world being taught to you when you listen to the worldly music. Now, just as much as we should not be listening to worldly music, our music, 
that, that we should be listening to good music, because there is good music that you can listen to, it should not be patterned after the world. It should not sound just like the world. It should be different. It should be sanctified. It should be holy. It should be separate. God wants us to live separate lives. He doesn't want us looking just like the world. He doesn't want us living just like the world. So why would he want us listening to exactly what the world listens to? Why would he want us watching just what the world watches? We actually learn from the music we listen to. You say, yeah, but I listen to Christian music. Did you know that most of the, the contemporary Christian music artists aren't even saved? They're not even saved. If they're not even saved, how in the world can that be of God and not of the world? Anybody who's unsaved, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, if you're not saved, you're of the world. And they don't understand the things of God, yet you're going to sit there and listen to someone sing and teach about the things of God from someone who's not even saved? There's all kinds of different beliefs that these people have. All you got to do is, if you could even find it, because a lot of them will hide it and not even want to tell what they believe, because they're just trying to, you know, reach the, the most number of people under this umbrella of Christianity, which is another reason why, you know, these people that are in it, they're in it for the money. Amen. They're not in it to serve and to worship God. The vast majority of these Christian artists that are out there today that you hear on the Christian radio stations, the ones that are selling the records, they're the ones that are going to have probably just the least amount of content because they don't want to offend anybody. It sounds just like the world. They're going to bring you the music that sounds like the rap and the rock and the metal and everything else that the world has out there so that you can say, oh, I love rock and I love rap and I love metal and I want to listen to this music, so let's just throw Jesus' name in there. We'll call it Christian and now I could just listen to all the same worldly music and just pretend that it's good and pretend that it's right. I'm still going to have some unsaved person singing about it because there's someone that probably couldn't make it in the, in the total worldly arena anyway, so they've switched over the Christian realm. But you have to ask yourself, do you really want to be listening to music put out by people who aren't saved, but are singing about Christ in the Bible and teaching you about Him? That's not something that we should be doing. Our music ought to be separate, different, not sounding like the world, and coming from people who are actually saved that have the Spirit of God. Now let's look at books. And again, when, when we look at, at books and things that you read, you know, I just brought a book in this morning. And I'm not against reading books. I'm not against reading books about the Bible, about other things. Um, I don't have a problem with it necessarily except that we ought to know who we're reading from, who the author is, what, what is their testimony, what do they believe, what do they at least claim to believe before you just go full in and just start reading all of this stuff. Um, now, obviously you can read books about history, which is not necessarily going to teach you any type of doctrine. So reading a book about history, well, you just have to understand that when you're reading about history, it is what it is. There's a possibility that it's not true, that it's wrong. You could take it for what it, for, for what it says, just like every other bit of history. And I'm not against learning about history. We, it, you know, we just have to understand that you can't take it as gospel truth. You take it as, well, this is what this person's claiming, and you can see how that, that matches up with what other people are saying and kind of get a, an impression of what was probably true and what was right. But you don't know that 100% for sure. And I'm not against reading that, but... With the books, again, if it's going to be about maybe about a specific doctrine, if it's going to be about like learning and the, like, like biblical truths and concepts, you're going to want to make sure that that person's saved. And especially when it comes to study Bibles and commentaries, we're going to look at one of the most popular study Bibles in the Baptist church is the, the Schofield Reference Bible. And so many people, you know, even, you know, good Fun, independent, fundamental Baptist churches that are soul winning and everything else still promote this book and I don't understand why. C.I. Schofield was a heretic and he's burning in hell right now. He was not saved and yet so many people will promote 
his work. And we'll say, oh yeah, you know, some of what he says isn't any good, but then other things are good, and you got to learn to just be able to pick and choose what's good. Look, the guy wasn't even saved. Why would you want to read any of his nonsense? I'm not going to read, you know, articles written by the Catholic Pope or some Catholic priest on the Bible and biblical concepts and what's true and what's not and just read through this stuff and try to glean, oh yeah, he said this, this is right. No, the guy's lost. The guy's got blinders on. He doesn't understand anything. Every once in a while, maybe the broken clock will be right. I know our broken clock is, probably, is more like these guys like Greece. They might never be right. This one isn't even right two times a day. But look at this, and just right off the bat in the Schofield Reference Bible, I know this is real common, you've probably heard this before, but just in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, as it gets started off, when, when, you're, when your commentary starts off this way, you need to just get rid of it. In verse number, um, verses number 1 and 2 of Genesis, saying, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And in the Schofield Notes, it says, without form and void, and this is the reference. Clearly, it's a, and it brings up a couple of scriptural references here. Jeremiah 4, 23-27, Isaiah 24, and Isaiah uh, 45, 18. It says, clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as the result of divine judgment. The face of the earth bears everywhere the marks of such a catastrophe. There are not wanting imitations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. And it says, see Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, which certainly go beyond the kings of Tyre and Babylon. So basically, this is where the gap theory is introduced. And he's saying that, see, right here in this area, and, and it's to, to be able to say, oh, the earth is millions and millions of years old. There's not a problem with that because the Bible teaches that the earth is not millions and millions of years old. The Bible teaches that the creation took place in a span of six literal days, 24-hour days, that God created everything in those six days. Amen. Yet, he starts off just right off the bat saying, oh yeah, because it, the Bible says the earth was without form and void as God's first creation, the earth was without form and void. So, Clearly, this means that there must have been another civilization prior to everything that's being taken place here in the first book of the Bible, and that there is a cataclysmic change. Now, one thing I want to I want to mention, even though this is this is very uh, just completely false, if you are going to do any type of of study Bible or anything like that. Don't just, because most people, they'll see, oh, see, they have all these references, and all they do is just read the conclusion. They just say, see, oh, well, clear, well, it must have undergone a cataclysmic change because this guy says so, and see, look, he puts all these references in here, but I'm kind of too lazy to go look him up. I just want to read through all of the notes because there's so many notes. I want to read all of them and just see what he has to say. If you are going to do any, and, and I don't really recommend the, the Bible uh, commentaries anyways, but if you do it, you better make sure that every single point that you read, you're going to be referencing that to see whether these things be so. Because we'll, we'll look at this. Let's look at Jeremiah uh, chapter 4. I probably won't go through all of these references just because that's not what the whole sermon's about. But just, just to point out why it's important to reference these things because he's saying these verses are just so, this just so clearly indicates that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change prior to creation. Prior to the earth being created, the earth was without form and void. That there was some, cat, some other civilization, angels and, and judgment and everything else going on. He says it's so clear when you read these other verses. Jeremiah chapter 4. Now, what I like to do I like to read the Bible in context, first of all. So even when they reference, I wouldn't ever just go to verses 23 through 27 like he says. If you're going to determine, is this really clearly talking about that? Why don't you try at least reading the entire chapter? Why don't you at least see what is Jeremiah talking about? Who is it written to? Who is he talking about? What are the things being said instead of trying to rip like one little verse out of context to try to support some bizarre view? 
Chapter 4, verse 1 of Jeremiah says, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. So it starts off talking about, you know, God pleading with them, hey, if you're going to return unto me, then you need to get rid of all the wicked abominations. So let's go, now let's jump down to verse 23. or ver Let's go up even to get more, let's start with verse 19 to get this in better context. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. So, and then it continues on, For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen, they shall go into the thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. Now when we read this in context, we can see that God is talking about bringing judgment upon a nation. But the Schofield Reference Bible would have you to believe that between verses just 23 and 27, all of a sudden, this isn't talking about God bringing judgment upon a nation anymore. This is talking about some previous civilization Clearly, right, clearly, this is talking about the creation of the world. Instead of the earth being without form and void, meaning empty, because it's been decimated, because an army has come through and completely destroyed the land. But he's saying, no, no, just because you see these words here, that must mean it's talking about the creation, because a similar wording was used when talking about the creation. So this must be, you know, so the whole book of Jeremiah and all, all of the warnings about, you know, judgment coming. Just right in the middle of this, in chapter 4, we're just going to go back and just, just say, oh yeah, this is talking about creation. Completely out of context. Makes no sense. And you could turn to the other ones and they'll say basically the same thing. I don't want to get any more involved in that than I have to. I've got too many other things to preach about this morning. So, it's ridiculous. Make sure if you do read a study Bible that you're looking at this, and, but make sure you're not looking at it. And I, I don't recommend them at all. I don't recommend them in the first place. But if you do, try to figure out a little bit about the people. You know, C.I. C. Schofield was, was a heretic. And you can read what he believed. You could find out some of the things that he believed. And right off the bat, you should be like, yeah, I don't want to read what this guy has to say. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, this is the reason why you need to be aware of the things that you read from people, whether it be a commentary Bible or just things about the Bible in general. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves which swift destruction. There are a lot of people out there that are false prophets and false teachers. And they're going to be among you, and they're going to, they're going to come from places that you're going to, they're, they're going to privately, they're going to privately, they're going to be real sneaky about it, trying to bring in damnable heresies. It says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 
And then jump down to verse 14. It says, having eyes full of adultery. So this is all talking about the false prophet. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. There are false prophets and false teachers out there that are looking to deceive you. They're looking to make merchandise off of you. They're looking to make money off of you. And they're looking to draw you away from the truth. They're, they're, they're full of wickedness. And they beguile unstable souls. So again, another point that I want to make about as far as even receiving information about the Bible and going to extra, extra biblical resources and reading all these other books, even the book that I brought in, if you haven't read this book multiple times cover to cover, I would say don't even, don't even think about reading any of these other books yet. Get yourself stable first in God's Word. Learn for yourself from here and learn pretty well before you're going to start really hearing what other people have to say, especially people you don't even know. And I'm going to get into that near the end of the sermon on, on why that's so important. In Jude also, Jude is, is a, like a parallel passage to 2 Peter chapter 2, again referring to false prophets. In verse 4, the Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, people creep in unawares. They come in sneakily. Verse 10, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. Again, the natural man. These are people who are not saved. They're not regenerate. They're natural men. And the things that they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. And they speak evil of those things they don't even know about. They don't know, the, they don't know about the truth. They don't know the, the things of God. Verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of... Now look at this. They have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Balaam in the Bible was a false prophet. He was supposedly a prophet of God, and he preached for money. He preached for gain. That's what he was concerned about. So it's saying these same people, these same false teachers, they're doing the same thing. They're following the example that Balaam set forth, that Cain set forth. It says, And perish in the gainsaying of Cory. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. These are definitely people you do not want to be reading their material. You do not want to know what's coming out of their heart and what's being presented to you as the truth, as this is what you really need to know about the Bible and they're going to write a book about it and make merchandise of you and try to teach you damnable heresies. Now, what about the internet preachers? Because there's another, there's a lot of people that there's there's pastors out there like we're like our church and other churches that will post sermons online. Obviously, we believe in preaching for as a, as a good source of, of learning. I've listened to sermons. I've listened to sermons from other pastors and other teachers um, online. So I'm not saying that they're a bad thing either. That, that's not. I'm not saying that's bad. But we need to take warning. We need to be careful about who we are getting our information from, with, whether it's books or even online and listening to preaching. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 16, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. We get names of two people here, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who were preaching false things. And he's saying, hey, watch out for these guys. They're overthrowing the faith of some people because they're saying that the resurrection is past already. The resurrection is yet to come. And they're saying, hey, this has happened already. And they're overthrowing people's faith. And it's something that he's warning about. He say, watch out for this profane and vain babblings. Watch out for these people who are teaching these strange doctrines. And don't listen to them. Because it can overthrow your faith. Ephesians chapter 4 is going to show us the tools that were ordained by God for us to learn from. So, 
Like I've mentioned before, you know, all of the things I've mentioned, I'm not just completely against them in particular, that they're, that they're just wicked in and of themselves, you know, wh whatever it be type of media, whether it be like a movie or music or anything like that, because God has ordained certain ways for us to learn, though. And, and reading a book, just to be honest with you, we're going we're gonna to see that reading a book isn't in here as a way that God is going to teach us, uh, unless that book is the Bible. But look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all him into him in all things which is the head even Christ so he gives, the bible says look you have apostles prophets evangelists teachers pastors to to help you to be to grow up in the faith to help strengthen you. That's why church is so important because this is where you find these people, these teachers, to help to teach you so that you're no more a child in the faith, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You're talking to different people. Oh, yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good. And you're real easily deceived just because you don't know, because you're a child, because you're, you know, you're a baby. I mean, you think about so many children, literal physical children today, are deceived by people. You know, hey, do you want some candy? Come on over here. And they sound real good. Oh, I'll give you a toy. I'll buy you this. And then they go and you know, defile them and, and kidnap them or whatever. Spiritually, that's going on also with the unstable souls, the people who are beguiling unstable souls, with the spiritual children that are tossed with every wind of doctrine because you don't really know the Bible. You don't know anything and you're getting tossed to and fro. Well, the, the job of the apostles and the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists is to, to teach you the truth and to, to help you to not be deceived by these uh, doctrines of devils. So that's one way we could learn. The Bible also says in John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Ghost leads us into all truth and wisdom. So when you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost can teach you as you read God's Word, as you're looking at God's Word. Let the Holy Ghost teach you as you read. Those are two ways that were ordained by God for us to learn through, through other men, through, you know, through coming to church and learning by the teacher or the pastor here, and just directly by the, by the Spirit of truth. Now, it's important to know who you are learning from based on their fruit. Matthew 7 is going to be how you know. You say, well, how do I even know? How do I know about these people? And when people just write a book and you have no idea who it is at all and you know nothing about them, you're not going to know what their fruit is. You don't know. You have no way to judge them. And people can be very sneaky and they can say a lot of things. One example of, of a way that people will gain your confidence and your trust will be to tell you, oh, we're King James only. Oh, you're King James only. Okay, yeah. You, you believe this is the word of God? Then you must be pretty close to what I believe in then because so many people reject that. Well, you just, I, I might as well just read this then because he's probably saved. He's probably right. He's King James only. And they just, just, you're, you're, level of awareness drops because you, you just kind of have a tendency to accept that. And this is why, you know, why you need to beware because there's a lot of people out there just trying to deceive. So they'll use these things and they'll say certain things to gain your confidence, your trust before teaching you all kinds of, of wicked doctrine. Matthew 7 verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. These are the people we have to watch out for. He's going to tell us how to watch out for them. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So there's people that say, oh, you know, I know that their doctrine on salvation is a little bit off. And they believe in works. 
Or they believe you could lose your salvation. But there's a lot of good things written in this book. No, a, a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. I'm sorry. So I'm not going to take anything that they are, they're uh, writing. I'm not going to read anything that they put out if I know that they are not saved. If I already know that they, they have a confession of faith that is not what the Bible teaches, that is not faith alone, that is you know, not of works, I know right off the bat I'm not going to even touch that. I, I don't care. I don't want to read what they have to say. Because a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. The Bible says, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. This is the way that God has given us to know. It's by their fruits. And what are their fruits? They're converts. What are they doing? When you can actually see the fruits of their ministry. Not just what they're saying. What they're saying should give you a really good indication. But more, more than that, the fruits. What is the fruits of what they're doing? Are they winning people to Christ? A lost soul cannot win a person to Christ. It can't happen. They don't even understand how to be saved themselves, so they're not going to be able to make a convert unto Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, it's the last place we'll look at. I'm almost done. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul was admonishing Timothy. Verse number 3, the Bible reads, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. A lot of people are just looking to read that something is okay. They're looking at itching ears. And they want to know that it's actually okay for me to do X, Y, and Z, to do this sin or to participate in this. You know, I've heard my pastor say that this is a sin, this is wrong, but I'm going to go get this book and I'm going to read it from this guy that I don't know anything about and he's telling me, oh, everything's just fine because of whatever, whatever his reason is. And a lot of people get deceived by these itching ears. But you know what? You're not able to, to know the full proof of that person's ministry. Because just some random person that you don't even know. Judge the people and, and receive information from people that you know and you can already judge and see what is this church doing? What is this guy doing? There's pastors of churches. You can see what they're doing. You can see how many converts are. You can see the way that they're, if they're leading people to Christ or not. And you could judge them by their fruits and then you can have a good idea to know, oh, okay, well, if this person puts out a book or a movie or whatever, I'm going to be able to, to at least know that a good tree cannot produce evil fruit, and an evil fruit cannot produce good fruit. So, when it comes to extra biblical content, out, sources outside of the Bible, don't have anything to do with the Hollywood stuff. Anything that's popular just on mainstream TV, it's not going to be good. Because if the world thinks it's okay and acceptable, it's not of the Father. Because the world hates the things of the Father. They're contrary the one to the other. They killed the Lord Jesus Christ and they crucified him. The world has not changed since then, if it, if not for the better at least. If they did that to Christ, do you think they're just going to allow just pure biblical truth to be, to be broadcast these days? I don't see it happening. And that's a, just one good indication that, uh, you know, not to to watch or, or get involved with this other stuff. But even the, the books, again, be careful. I'm going to be allowing people to, to bring books. I, I, I learn from books. I read books. But I'm very, very selective on the ones that I will even read. And then I'm going to be very selective on what they say because if there's, if, even if I believe that someone is saved and, 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 and may be a good resource, if there's just too much things that, that I think are wrong, I'm not going to put it out there because I'm not going to endorse it in that way. But, um, you know, we need to be careful with, the, with what we look at. And no matter what, the, the vast majority of our time should be spent in this book as opposed to every other method of, of learning. We should be spending more time reading this for ourselves than going online, reading articles, reading things other people put out. And, you know, people put all kinds, and, and even not just books, but, you know, maybe more common these days is just reading articles put, posted online. I mean, I, I've seen articles about all kinds of things of people trying to, to prove that, 
it's okay for women to wear pants. It's okay for uh, people to drink alcohol. It's okay for all this other stuff. And again, they're written by people that, who are these people? What do they really believe? I don't know. They're going to they're gonna try to bring you some evidence, but are they even saved? Where is their source? Do they even have the light of the gospel shining inside of them to give them proper understanding, holy spiritual understanding of God's word as opposed to what the, you know, what's true and what's right. You know, anybody can, can have an opinion on the Bible. I was just having a, a, a person comment on the sermon I preached about 1 Corinthians 11 about, you know, men having long hair and women having short hair and stuff. I mean, it's very, that is very, very clear and laid out in the Bible. It's, it's, it's so ridiculously clear that you are just willfully rejecting God's word to, to see that any other way. And they're like, this is the oddest interpretation of the Bible ever. It was like the comment they were, I'm like, first of all, it's not an interpretation. It's what the Bible says. I'm not interpreting anything. When the Bible says, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair is a shame unto him? There's no interpretation needed for that. It's a pretty standalone statement. It says what it says. But these are the types of things that the, the lost world, they don't get it. They don't understand. Even something as simple as that, they, they reject it. And, and they will have nothing to do with it. So we don't want to be reading the commentary from some guy that's going to teach you, well, actually... You know, when it says that it's a, you know, does not even nature itself teach you to say, well, that was, you had to understand their culture back then, and you have to, you know, and just try to explain away every reason why it doesn't actually mean what it says. You run across someone trying to explain why the Bible doesn't mean what it says? Don't listen to that person. Because the, God's not going to write us words that he didn't mean. That, oh, actually, they say this, and I know you would, you would normally understand it to mean that it's really a shame, but it, it actually, that's not what it means. It's actually okay for, for men to have long hair. So be careful who, where you get your information from. Go straight to the source, as with anything. And if you ever want to know anything, this, is, this can apply to all areas of your life. If you want to know the truth about any situation, go to the source. If you hear something that someone says about someone else, don't rely on what they say to be true. Go straight to the source. Oh, so-and-so said this about you. Really? I'm going to go to the source and I'm just going to believe what someone else said. You go straight to the source. And we have the source right here of everything that we should believe. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your words, dear Lord. We pray that you would please give us wisdom and discernment and, and uh, being able to accept or reject information that comes our way, dear Lord, that you would help to guide us into all truth and wisdom and knowledge, dear God. I pray that you would please help us use these, these fundamental principles in determining what we should and should even be exposing ourselves to, dear Lord, that we're not just learning the way of the heathen, but that we're studying to show ourselves approved unto God, dear Lord, um, studying your word and, uh, and hearing from people who actually have the spirit of God residing in them for, for our source of information, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.